So this week we're going to take a look at vectors, which is section 8.5 in your regular textbook. So if you want to look anything up in your regular book, you can go to 8.5. But I'm using a different book this week, and I think it'll say for tonight and tomorrow, section 5.4. Right, so if you go to the PDF file, uh, it'll be the correct problems you need to do. Uh, that, that's how I would do it. Just go to the homework and click on the PDF. All right, so let's start out um, by talking a little bit about what a, a vector is. So a lot of times I assume people have no knowledge of it because they haven't studied it. Um, but those people that have taken physics, does anybody know what two quantities a vector represents? It represents two things at the same time. Yeah. Magnitude and direction. Yep, magnitude and a direction. So. Can someone give me an example of something that you would use a vector for? What would be, John? Velocity. Yep, velocity is a vector. Because when you describe velocity, you're describing the speed of something, that's the magnitude, and you're describing the direction of the object. Okay, so speed and direction. Another example would be force. Uh, have you guys done vectors with force? So force basically des describes two things. How hard you're you know, exerting a force on something and what direction. You know, are you pushing sideways on it? Are you pulling up on it? A different direction. So there's a few different ways that we can represent vectors. Um, we're going to talk about how to represent them just as numbers eventually. Um, but we're going to start out by representing them visually. Okay, and the best way to represent it visually um, is using an arrow. If I want to use an arrow to represent a vector, how do you think I would represent a bigger magnitude vector? What do you think would be different about the arrow? John? Longer. Yeah, it would be longer. So the longer you make the arrow, that represents a bigger magnitude. And then, of course, because it's an arrow, you can point it whatever way you want. So there's, there's your direction. And generally, we're going to be focusing on pretty simple vectors. Like if we were doing a word problem um, and something was moving in a certain direction, it would stay moving in that direction the whole problem. It's not going to be like moving at an angle of 30 degrees for part of the time, and then it's going to like shift and go in a different direction. Right? It'll, it'll stay the same direction for the whole problem. Not as realistic, because if you think about like a, an airplane, so I got some examples up here. Each one of these planes, you know, if we click on one of them, can be represented as a vector. So I'll just click on one of them. And, oops, there we go. All right, so let's see what's going on here. So first of all, it might be a little hard to see, but it has a speed. And the speed is 519 miles an hour. So there's, there's the magnitude. Now, the direction, in this case, is represented by a root. So it's a little more complicated than a single direction because the plane is changing directions um, as it flies. So it looks like it, you know, it goes northeast a little bit, and then north, and then northeast, and then there's probably lots of even little turns in there you can't, you can't see. All right? But it's, it's changing directions. Most of the directions, if you think about it in terms of a compass, are north and northeast. So a lot of them are going to be pretty close to zero degrees and maybe like um, 45 degrees. So if we click on the code, it'll actually tell you the directions for the route. Um, and you can see most of them like 25, 40, 32, 32, 37, 42. So a lot of them are around 45 degrees, which represents going northeast. Right. So we can see how long it traveled on that course, and then we can also see um, uh, all kinds of other information about it, but I'm not 100% sure what that is. 
you know, we could see the location where it started on that course. So we could pinpoint exactly where, it, where the plane turned. All right. But the point is all kinds of directions um, and magnitudes. And basically, each airport has to control you know, the traffic coming into and leaving the airport. So a computer could think of all these different planes uh, as vectors. A little more complicated than what we're looking at right now, because we're not looking at 3D. So it could look like two planes are pretty close, but in reality, you know, one of them could be on the ground and one of them could be up in the air. Uh, and the more you zoom in, you can see they're really not um, as close as they look. You know, they could be miles and miles apart. So any question on that? Yeah. Can you go look over Ukraine? Can I? <laughs> uh, I don't know if... Oh man, it's going to take a while to get there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll do it after, because it's just, right. this is really... Oh man, this is going to take as long, because it would really to travel there. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to do it from my computer. Can you shrink it first? Uh, I can't shrink from here. I can, I can zoom in, but it, it's actually not really zooming out, but I can't. I can't zoom out. So, yeah, we'll check. We'll check. <laughs> but, anyway, lots of, lots of points. All right. So, uh, one way we can represent kind of where a vector starts and where it stops is using coordinates. Right? And the two coordinates would be called an initial point and a terminal point. So if you think of, vector, think of a vector as an arrow, where the vector starts, I've called point P, and where it stops, I've called point Q. If you think back to the uh, example with the airplanes, they had latitude and longitude coordinates. And the same idea. It's basically giving you a location for where a certain part of the route for the plane started and where it stopped. Now, sometimes we can also symbolize a vector by a single letter. So if I wanted to refer to this vector and say something about it, it gets kind of cumbersome to keep saying the vector that starts at P and ends at Q. It'd be nice if I could just call it vector X or something like that. But what's the problem with just using a single letter to represent a vector? We use single letters to represent something else in math. Yeah? It's, it's a variable, so it like represents a magnitude or a scale, like a scalar quantity or whatever. So yeah, a single letter represents a variable. Like if you write two x equals ten, okay, that's a variable x. So if we're going to use a single letter for a vector, how do we make it different than a variable? Because a variable and a vector are two totally different things. Well, one thing you can do is you could call a vector. Just pick a letter. And you could put a line or put an arrow on top of it. That's the notation you use in geometry. Um, similar notation for array in geometry. All right. And then the other thing you can do is you could make the letter bold, which is pretty much how uh, our textbook does it. What's the difference between array and a vector when you do it in that like in that form, the first one? Well, these two represent the exact same thing. Yeah, no, I'm just saying like when you look at geometry and do array, what's the difference? Between oh, the array and the vector? well, usually in geometry, they they actually write the two letters out. So like in geometry, they put ray p and q, so you know it starts at p and ends at q. Um, when we deal with vectors, at least in our book. I haven't seen them write it out as two letters. They usually just use the one. So when you're looking at something like this, you don't really know what the initial and terminal point were called. You'd have to go back up and reference the diagram to see it. Right. Any question on those, those two notations? So whenever you write a name for a vector, make sure you write it either as a letter with an arrow on top. And this arrow doesn't ex necessarily indicate that it's pointing right. 
Okay, if you're going to use this first notation, the arrow always points to the right on top. That, that's just how it is. Or you can make it bold. All right, so we're going to think about a few different operations with vectors this week. Um, and one of the first ones we're going to do is adding them. So I want to think about what would happen if you add two vectors together. And the easiest way to maybe visualize it is to think about it I think as a force. So pretend you had an object right there. And there was a force acting to the right. And then there was another force acting up at the same time. What would happen to the object at that point if those two forces acted on it at the same time? Yep. Or the code or these. Yeah, it would move in a new direction, and it would also have a new magnitude. So if you take the way you could actually figure out exactly which way it moves, is take this, take that, and draw that. That's exactly the direction that would result from the two black vectors combining together. So you notice it's a new direction, and it's a little bit longer than either of the original um, vectors. And if you think about it in terms of a triangle, it has to be, because it's like the hypotenuse of a triangle. So it has to be a little bit longer than the other two. But the point here is, we got a new vector when you add two vectors together. Now, depending on the original vectors, it, it could be longer, like in that case, or it actually could be shorter. And I'll show you an example of where that happens. Also, in this case, these two vectors aren't fighting each other at all. They're not reinforcing or they're not helping each other either, but they're not fighting against each other. All right. So fighting against each other would be like if you had one vector pushing down and another one pushing up. Now they're, they're working against each other and which way the object would move would depend on which one is stronger. So I kind of already showed you guys how to do this, but I'll do it one more time. We'll take two vectors and we'll add them graphically. So I'll, I'll show it one more time, then I'll, I'll write the steps out. So let's say that this is V, and this is W, and you want to add them together. Well, the way you do it is you line them up so the beginning of one vector and the end of the other share the same point. So this is V, and this is W, and you want to do V plus W, you do it just like this. Line up the end of V so it's at the exact same point as the beginning of W. And then you're going to connect the diagonal. The diagonal always goes from the beginning to the end, just like that. So we started over here, and we ended up there. And that would be the answer when you do V plus W. Yeah. We'll talk about what happens if you do W plus V. Would it come out the same? Uh, well, we'll see in a minute. But here's the description of what we just did. So position the two vectors so that the ending point of V, which is that point, is right in line with the starting point of W. That point. Okay, so I had those two points lined up. And then to figure out the new vector, draw in it's like a diagonal from the starting point of V, which was that, to the terminal point of W, which was that. Okay, so lining them back up again. Take this one. Take that. Line it up just like that. And put in your diagonal, just like that.
if you're using graph paper, it's a lot easier to be a little bit more precise, especially if they ask you a question uh, about like how long a vector is or something. You're going to need a way to measure it, whether they give you coordinates of where the vector starts and stops. You can measure it that way. Or if you're using graph paper, it works OK for small problems. But if you have really big problems, then graph paper starts to get not as practical. Okay. Questions on that idea? So uh, let's try adding these two vectors up, and we'll um, we'll do it on this grid. Again, you don't really need a grid if you just draw them roughly. You'll get the idea. All right. So we're going to take v, w, add them up. What you kind of want to do here is think about the directions v and w are going in. So when you place them on your grid, you don't end up going off the edge. I can tell that both of these vectors go to the right. So I want to start as far to the left as I can, drawing things. Don't start this problem like right on the right edge of the page. You're going to run out of space. So I'm going to try. You know what? I think I'm going to need to move the grid. Yeah, that'll be better. All right. So I'm going to put V right there. And it doesn't matter where you put it. Okay, you just put V somewhere. Now put W. Right? On the end of it. Any question what I did there? All right, so now, draw in the diagonal, but you have to draw it from where the start is to where the stop is. This, this is the start, okay, right there. Over here is where it stops. And if I drag it away, then you can see it. That is V plus W. So if you look at, look at what happened, you had a vector that was pointing down and to the right, and then you had another vector that was pointing to the right. So when you combine them, you get an even bigger vector pointing to the right and still pointing um, down. Any question on that? Another way, I don't know if you guys looked at it, those who are in physics, but if we line this up, you know, kind of like that, you could count how many down, I guess, how much down this vector goes. So it goes down one, two, three. Uh, uh, yeah, roughly it goes down one, two, three, and it goes over. Oh, no, it goes down four, doesn't it? Yeah, it goes down four. And then it goes over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 and a half or so. So we know it goes down 4 and right 13 and a half. If you look at your original vectors and do it numerically, you'd get the same result. This vector goes down 1, 2, 3, 4. So there's the down 4. And this goes right 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And this one goes right, I'm going to put it about right here, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and a half, if I count it right. So basically, if you look at the original two vectors and count how far down and right they go, the final vector should go down and right that much. It's a little off because I'm not on a grid line, so that makes it a little harder to figure out. Any question on that? All right. Um, let's look at this one. Okay, what do you think is going to happen here? Oh, it's not going to move. So if these were forces pushing on an object, the object wouldn't move? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's happening here is they're going to cancel out. So it's going to be hard once I line them up to see exactly what's happening. But you're going to take the end point of V, which is right there. And you're going to line it up with the start point of W. So you're going to line those two black dots up. And once you line those up, then you're going to connect the beginning of V to the end of W. So line the black dots up, and then whatever you, whatever you get, connect the red dots. Well, 
if we line the black dots up, then the red dots also line up. They're the same point. Well, what did we say when you add two vectors together? You always get what? You always get another vector. So you, you have to write the answer as a vector. And this one is called the zero vector. So you can write it one of two ways. You can make it bold, or you could do it like that. But the answer here is not a number. It's always a vector when you add two vectors together. Zero vector, a little bit kind of an exception in terms of having a magnitude and a direction. Um, the zero vector has a magnitude of zero. But if it has a magnitude of zero, then it really doesn't have a direction. So that's kind of a special case. Right, but that, that's the answer, the zero vector. Okay, questions on that? All right. So I said earlier, you know, we're going to do v plus w, and then we'll see what happens if we do w plus v. Uh, well, it turns out you can add them in a different order, and you'll get the same answer. So commutative property means if you switch the order you add two things in, you still get the same answer. Let's try. So to demonstrate uh, commutative property, I only need two vectors. Here's v, here's w. If I add them together as v plus w, I would do that. Now it might be a little off because these vectors are they have a thickness to them, so I'm just trying to line them up the best I can. Okay. And V plus W would look about like that. Now, let's do it the other way. Let's take W and put V on the end of it. Now connect where we started to where we stopped. About like that. And that is W plus V. Now, if we line them up, hopefully they look, yeah, it's pretty good. So they came out to pretty much be the same. So the vector addition is commutative. And you can do this with more than two. Okay, we've only been adding two vectors together. But if you had something like that one like that, one like that, another one like that, one like that. You can add all of those vectors together. Just connect the beginning of one to the end of the other. Just connect them all together, just like this. And then the final answer is where you started to where you finished. And if you had added those vectors in a different order, it wouldn't have made a difference. Right. And the other property that you can use with vectors is associative. So associative doesn't have anything to do with the order. It's A, B, C on both sides. It has to do with what you do first. So to show this one, I need three vectors. And on the left one, I'll do A plus B first. Let's do that. Um, you know what, I'm going to adjust B a little bit because it's trying to um, snap to a point that I can't, I can't get to. So let's do it like that. So there's A plus B. Let's put that back there. And now we're going to add C onto the end of that. So there's C. Final answer. Just like that. So that represents A plus B plus C. Now, put that back there. This we're done with. Let's add B plus C first, and then we'll add that answer onto the end of A. 
So here's B plus C. Take that. Okay, it might not come out quite as good as the last one because I'm not, I'm just drawing it by hand. So there's B plus C. And now take A and add that on the end. There's A, put that on the end. And that's just, again, me doing it pretty rough, but so that came out pretty good. Any question on uh, associated property? All right, so doing it visually is fine. We're going to do a little bit more visually, but eventually we want to get away from drawing it. Um, anybody know what, why drawing it might not always be the best? I think for a word problem it's good, but why, why is, do you think drawing isn't always the best way to add vectors or do things like that? You're too well. Yeah, it takes a while, right? If you're going to do it nice, you really need a piece of graph paper. You need something that you can draw a straight line with. And there's easier ways to add things up than actually having to make a picture every time you want to do it. Right? So we'll eventually start to get away from drawing. Right. What's the di difference between those two things? Vector v and the negative of vector b. Anyone have a guess what? Something would be the same, but something else would be different. Yep. Would it be 2b? Would negative b just be connected to the end of b and it would just be double the size of b? Um, so I mean, if you looked at them as two, like if I drew b and I drew negative b, how would they look different? Two, like on two separate graph, pieces of graph paper. Yep. Are we going in different directions? Can you be more specific about the direction? Like the opposite. Right, they go in exactly opposite directions. That's that's what negative that's what a negative in front of a vector does. So the difference is the direction they point. How about their magnitudes? John? The magnitude is the same. Yeah, the magnitude is exactly the same. And we saw an example of this earlier. When you add a vector and the negative of that vector together, you get the zero vector. It's exactly what we did in example, example two. V and W are just negatives of each other. Again, they point in opposite directions, but they have the same magnitude. All right, so we've looked at how to add two vectors visually. Now we're going to do subtraction. And I tried to give you a little bit of a hint with what we just talked about. Anyone have a guess how we're going to do subtraction by graphing? John? I mean, like you put it in the opposite direction. Then you if you have a vector, you put it in the opposite direction of another, like that same vector, and then you add the first vector to the second vector. So yeah, so the way we're going to do subtraction is we're really going to do adding. But what we're going to do is add the opposite. By adding the opposite, you're really doing subtracting. So it's kind of like um, this. If I was explaining subtraction and somebody didn't understand it, but they understood addition with negative numbers, I'd say it's the same thing. Instead of subtracting something, just add the opposite. And that's really doing subtracting. In terms of a vector, the opposite means flip the direction of the second vector. All right, so to subtract two vectors, find the opposite of the second one. So look at the second one, find the opposite of it, and then add instead. Right, that's the easiest way to subtract two vectors visually. Okay, so they want us to do V minus W. Well, here's V, here's W. How am I going to think of V minus W as an addition problem? Yep. V plus negative W. Yeah, 
Yeah, exactly the way I did it with numbers. We're going to do V plus negative W. So the first thing I need is negative W. So easiest way if you're using some kind of software to draw vectors, uh, if you have a rotate 180, that, that works. Um, if you don't have that, you can reflect it twice. So if you reflect it horizontally and then vertically, that's equivalent to rotating 180. All right, so now we've got negative w. Then we're going to do exactly what Mabel just said, v plus negative w. So here's v. Actually, I can just leave that right up there. There's negative w. Connect them. That's the answer for v minus w. Questions on that one? All right. All right, so there's a few things we're going to look at with multiplication. This is not multiplying a vector times a vector. So we're going to do that on Wednesday. This is what we call scaling a vector. And when you think of scaling something, like if you build a scale model of something, what does that generally mean? If it's a model of something, but it's built to scale. Yeah? It's proportionate, but not the size. Yeah, it's proportional to the original size, but it's not necessarily. It could be a, a scale could be larger or smaller. If you were building a scale model of a house, you're probably building it smaller. If you were building maybe like a scale model of, a, of an atom, something like that, you're going to build it bigger. But the point is, it's a larger or smaller version of what you started with. So when we multiply a number times a vector, it would look like this. That number that we multiplied the vector by in front, okay, that's called a scalar. And a scalar can do one of three things to a vector. It can make it longer. What else do you think a scalar can do? Yeah? Make it shorter. Make it shorter. What's the third thing you think it would do? Longer, shorter, and one more. John? Uh, so if you multiply by one, it would keep it the same. So technically, yeah, you could, could have that too. So longer, shorter, the same. And then there, there is one more thing. Yeah? It could change the direction if you multiply by a negative scalar. Okay, so I guess technically there's four things that can happen. Longer, shorter, stay the same, or reverse the direction 180 degrees. Usually, if you're going to multiply by 1, since the vector would stay the same, they don't even put the 1. That would kind of be like if I put the 1 in front of this problem. Well, if it's just 1, then you don't have to do it. Okay. And this is called a scalar product. So what's the result when you do a scalar product? Here, you have a vector, and you're multiplying it by a number. What are you going to end up with for the type of answer? Yeah? Um, so like, if you triple vector v, could you describe to me what the end result would be? Yes, it would be 3 times the original vector, and when you multiply by 3, essentially that would make the vector what? 3 times larger. Lar longer, yes. So if it was 10 units, now it's 30 units. So it's a vector. So scalar multiplication results in a new vector. Okay. It doesn't result in a number, it results in a vector. All right, so let's try this one. So we've got vector v, and the first thing they want us to find is 2v. 
Sophie, what, what's 2B, or how is 2B going to compare to B? It's going to be twice as long. Twice as long. Easiest way to do that here. Um, how could I get 2B exact here? Without measuring it. I don't, want, I don't want to get a ruler and say, all right, that's 7.6, so let's make it, you know, 15, whatever. Yep. All right, so take, make a copy of it. All right. Like that? Yeah. If you have to do an integer multiple of a, of a vector, it's very easy. You just copy it that many times. There you go. And then connect it. That's your final answer, and that's 2B. Now, if you had to do a decimal like 2.7, uh, then you're probably going to have to measure it if you're trying to do it exact or use a computer or something. All right, one half B. Uh, so, Caleb, what's that going to look like compared to the original? It's going to be half the length. Half the length? What about direction? Same direction. Same direction. So I'm just going to estimate roughly where I think a half is. Again, if you use graph paper, you don't have to estimate. Okay. Questions on that? All right. All right, so this one, uh, let's see, find another two more scalar products, negative v and negative one-third v. So Madison, what, um, what's going to happen with this first one? It's just going to change direction to the opposite way. Yep, it's going to go the opposite way. So I could figure that one out exact, but I just drew it. So there's negative v. And Maddie, how about negative one third v? It's going to be a third of the of v in the other direction. Right, a third of v, and it's going to point the other way. Well, I already have it pointing the other way, so I'll just use that. And I'm just going to estimate one third, roughly. One third. Question on that one. So we've looked at adding vectors, subtracting vectors, and scaling them, kind of all separate. Um, let's look at one where we add and scale in the same problem. Uh, let's just do the second one. We don't have to do both. Now this requires you to kind of plan ahead a little bit because you want to start on your grid somewhere that you can keep connecting things and not go off the edge. So I'm looking at V, and that goes up and to the right. So we don't want to start right on the upper right area. And then we're going to need the opposite of W, which is going to go up and to the left. So we're going to be going up a lot. So we want to make sure we start far enough down, and then we're going up again. All right, so yeah, we want to make sure we start, I would say, probably you know, down in here. Start, let's start right about there. So we're going to start with 2v. You don't have to figure out what 2v is separate. Just draw two copies of v right on your grid. All right, so it looks like v goes up to right 3. So all you have to do is do that again. Up 2, right 3, and there's 2v. All right, next step, we need negative w. So I'm going to take w, and I'll flip it, and flip it again. So that's exactly negative w. All uh, right about that. And then the last thing I need is to add u onto the end. Right, so about like that. And now we're going to connect where we started to where we stopped. Think of those arrows as like pretend like it was like water in a pipe. 
Right? That's the direction that it flows in. Everything has to flow the same way. If you ever end up with something like this, well, that, that would almost be like a collision. Right? You can't, you drew something wrong if you end up with two arrowheads pointing at each other like that. Okay, the arrowhead should follow them like a half. Right. Final answer is right there. Questions on that? All right, so sketching them again, fine, but eventually we're going to start to get away from vectors being sketched, and that's kind of what I'm getting towards now. So this symbol, if you ever see it, double bars around a vector, it means the magnitude of it. So if you see that symbol, it means to find the magnitude. And what kind of answer would the magnitude always be, you think? Positive? Um, all right, well, technically, what if you have this? What would the magnitude of that be? Yeah? Zero. Zero. So maybe a better way to ask it would have been to say, what will the magnitude never be? It will never be negative. But it could be zero or a positive number. But the point is it's always a number. Okay, so when you put those symbols around it, the answer is a number. Uh, again, I'm going to word it the way I did. I think that's a little better. Um, it's never negative. Not necessarily positive, it could be zero. All right. If you wrote down the answer to, say, this problem on the left and the one on the right, how would your two answers compare? Caleb? Would they be the same? They're the same. Sometimes people say, well, the direction is different. That's not what it's asking. It's asking you how long is each vector. And they're exactly the same. Magnitude does not care about the direction it points. It's just how long is it from here to here. If the magnitude comes out to exactly 1, we call that a unit vector. Okay, we're going we're gonna to do a lot with unit vectors. Um, starting tomorrow and for the rest of the week. But for now, that's all I'm really going to say about unit vectors. It's just a vector that is exactly one unit long. Not sure if you talked about it in physics, but there are few special unit vectors that have certain names. For example, the vector that points one unit right, one unit up, and one unit out all have special names. And we'll start tomorrow looking at the ones that point just up and right. In and out gets into 3D, so we'll, we'll look at that on Thursday. All right, so we said earlier, drawing vectors time-consuming, you got to kind of plan it out, where you're going to be on the graph paper. Not the most efficient way to do some things with vectors. Word problem, draw it all the way. You definitely want to make a sketch. If you just want to add two things together, I mean, think about regular math. You don't draw pictures every time you want to add two things together. Now, maybe in like kindergarten, you learn, you know, you look at pictures, but there's a, there's a better way. So one way we can represent vectors without drawing them is called an algebraic vector. And that's represented with angle brackets, two numbers inside and a comma between them. Kind of like a coordinate, but very important you don't use parentheses. If you use parentheses, then it is a coordinate. A and B are what we call the component.
components of the vector. When you're dealing in 2D, you only have two components, horizontal and vertical. Right, so let me sketch a vector and just show you what I mean by, uh, the, by the components. Right, here's the vector 2, 3. It means start somewhere, go right to, and up three. Right, two, up three. That's the vector two, three. We could do it over here, right two, up three. Do it over here, right two, up three. Okay, those are all the vector two, three. The horizontal component is two, and the vertical is three. If you don't see it in the sketch, Easiest way is make it into a triangle. The two and the three are basically two sides of the triangle. So what those two numbers tell you, if you kind of want to spell it all out, is it tells you from an initial point how far left and right you go, and then how far up and down you go to get to the final, to the, get to the terminal. So the two and the three are, they're basically directions. Start at an initial point, go two units right, and then go three units up. Now the components can be negative. That's fine, if the component is negative, that just means start somewhere and then go left instead of right, or go down instead of up. So A, that's always the first number. Inside those angle brackets, that's the horizontal. And B is the second number, and that's always the vertical. What this notation doesn't really tell you is where in the plane to put the vector. And if we go back to my example, I put it in three different spots. If I said to draw that, and you did any one of those three, you would be right. Or Anywhere else, as long as you go right to and up three. But there is a more common place that you usually start from. Does anybody have a guess uh, where we generally put the initial point of a vector? Do you have a choice? The yeah. origin. Yeah, we generally put it at the origin. And if you start with the start with the initial point at the origin. That is called a position vector. So the last thing we're going to look at is how can you figure out what a vector should be if it doesn't start the origin? How can you find the position vector? Right, I'll go back to the vector 2, 3, and uh, move this up. But just to avoid negatives, I'm going to draw one more copy of it over here. Let's take this vector and see if we can figure out how to get the vector 2, 3. And let's say you only knew where it started and stopped. What's the coordinate of where that vector starts? 2, 6. Yeah, looks like 2, 6. And how about where it stops? Four nine. Four nine. Does anyone see how you could take the two six and the four nine and somehow come up with the vector two three? Subtract. Subtract them in what order? The start. Yeah. So if you take the coordinates of the terminal and you minus the coordinate of the initial. 4 minus 2, 9 minus 6, that will give you a position vector. So now if you wanted to draw it from the origin, you know, oh, okay, right 2, up 3. So let's write down that um, formula, and that'll be the last thing. So how do you find a position vector? 
Well, the first thing they have to do is give you the starting point and the stop point. If they don't tell you which point is which, and they just say, here's a vector, here's P1, here's P2, always assume P1 is the start point, P2 is the stop point. All right, so P1 has a coordinate, that's where it starts. P2 has a coordinate, that's where it ends. To find the position vector, take and subtract terminal minus initial for the x's, and then do terminal minus initial for the y's. Now, is subtraction commutative? No. So if you switch the order, then you won't you won't get it right. You'd actually get a vector that points in the opposite direction. Any question on the uh, on the form? All right. Let's try one example of that. Okay, so find the position vector. Okay, let's, to do the x and the y, let's write out the calculation. So if you're going back and looking at it, you know how we've, we've got the numbers. What would be your calculation for the horizontal component of the vector? Yep. 4 minus negative 1. 4 minus negative 1. Yep. So in other words, horizontal component of 5. And what would be your calculation for the vertical? Six minus two. Six minus two, which is four. And that's how you find a position vector. Any questions on that? All right. So homework tonight, remember, it is from a different book. So if you want to look at the whole chapter, make sure you go to the book on vectors. Otherwise, just go to the PDF for the homework. It'll be right there. Um, so it's 1 through 10. That's all. And then 14 to 22 and 26 to 32 is even. But on 26 to 32, they ask you to do a couple things. Just find the position vector. We haven't talked about the other thing that they ask you to do. Yeah. 